nonprofit studies at Austin Community College. And welcome to Civil Society, where we explore issues affecting our communal well being through a nonprofit lens. We're proud partners of ACC TV, but given the COVID 19 situation, we're going virtual for our fourth season. Our center is fully committed to being an anti racist organization, to accelerating our personal learning journeys, to confronting our biases and blind spots, and creating opportunities for others to do the same. This episode is part of an eight part series on the Black experience in Austin, which is part of our larger commitment to similar series on the Latinx, Asian, and Native American experiences in Austin. Back in June, uh, we, we said in a public statement, we are moved by a new sense of urgency to heighten our community's consciousness of institutional racism and systemic impediments of racial equity and to aggressively progress on the continuum to racial equity to fulfill America's promise to all of its inhabitants. You can access copies of this broadcast when it's done, as well as future and prior programs at nonprofitaustin.org slash civil society. My guest today is Dr. Colette Pierce Burnett, the first female president of Houston Tillotson University, who was appointed five years ago. Congratulations, happy anniversary. Thank you. July, July 1, 2015. She's a native of Cleveland, Ohio, and per her bio, uh, it says that she has the IQ, EQ, entrepreneurial spirit, and technical knowledge to forge successful careers in engineering, information technology, and higher education. Once Colette moved into higher education, she assumed leadership roles, including as interim president at Pierce College in the state of Washington. Colette is a strong proponent of historically black colleges and universities, and most beneficial to us in Austin, of civic and communal engagement. Under her bio in small letters, it says, Dr. Burnett is on a mission to elevate Houston Tillotson University to the highest ranks and amplify its presence as the intellectual heartbeat of East Austin. As someone who's been here during her entire tenure, I think she's moving that along very well and accomplishing just that. She currently holds leadership positions in Austin as co-chair of the Mayor's Task Force on Institutional Racism and Systemic Inequities, Board Chair of Leadership Austin, and Treasurer of the Independent Colleges and Universities of Texas, among many others. She serves on numerous boards and committees, including in Austin, the Greater Austin Black Chamber, the Greater Austin Urban League, Big Brothers and Big Sisters of Central Texas Advisory Council and the Waterloo Greenway Board, and as I said, many, many others. She's been recognized and honored many, many times for her achievements and contributions, including but not limited to Ohio State University Engineering Alumnus Award and named one of the 10 most influential women in Austin. Her complete bio can be found, and, and the resources relating to today's, today's discussion can be found at nonprofitaustin.org slash civil society. So Colette, thank you for joining me on this, which happens to be your second uh, time on civil society. The first was, I guess, three years ago uh, when we were part of a panel on diversity and equity in Central Texas. So you are probably one of the busiest people uh, that I know. Uh, and so my first question to you is very basic. How do you manage your time so effectively? Oh, thank you, Barry. First of all, I need to thank you for the opportunity to be with you again. We had a lot of fun the first time and I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you. Time seems to be a continuum. Um, I woke up on Sunday and thought it was Monday um, because the days <laughs> seem to blend together. And I have some very structured people who work with me that help me stay on task and help me to manage the what happens in the day so that I can focus on what's important. I was um, on a virtual happy hour with a very dear friend of mine and we were talking about self-care and she was asking me, am I taking care of myself? 
because I preached that a lot to my friends. And I had to confess that at this time, I cannot find the time to unwind because it's such a, it's such, um, you op we operate in a crisis when you serve at a small minority serving institution in a city like Austin all the time. So crises are relative, but this has compounded it with the civic unrest and the pandemic, it has compounded it, compounded it. So I'm just not doing a very good job of self care, but I will catch up on it um, as soon as I can get my students settled in in the fall. Well, you like- But I'm not a role model for someone, you know, I'm managing my time, but I'm not managing my, my self-care very well. So I'm not the role model for that right now. I think I'll send you some chicken soup. Yeah, very good. Very nice. <laughs> very nice. So it's fascinating that you started out in the hard sciences, engineering. Um, so what motivated you to have a career in higher education? And how did you come to uh, Houston Tillotson? I had been an engineer probably about 17 years. And I, um, I, my husband is a retired military officer, so we've traveled all around the world. And I had some very wonderful positions. I worked at the Washington Post as a systems analyst, and I worked for the State Depart the Department of Transportation for the state of Washington, and I reached that proverbial glass ceiling as a um, black female engineer. I had was running a, a big operation, big technology operation, responsible for all of the systems on the for the state of Washington's transportation system, the ferries, the railroads, the highways, et cetera. But I didn't have purpose. And I taught a class in information technology at the University of Washington um, um, in Tacoma. And I had this revelation about purpose and what I really wanted to do. And I was raised in a family where education was really pushed. Um, I'm first generation, but I've said this often. I thought that college was the 13th grade. I didn't know I had an option. My parents were, were determined that I was going to go to college. And so I think I had this, I went into engineering because I was good in math in high school. And if you were black, you were a woman and you're good in quote unquote, good in math, put air quotes around that because I have, I have a whole feeling about that. Um, you were forced into engineering from your counselor, everyone around you. So I became an engineer because people who were around me, guiding me, said that that's what I should do. I didn't have passion. And I really preach now that people need to follow their passion. Um, your success, you're better at what you do when you enjoy doing it. And once I found that passion, I took a leap of faith and I quit my job as an engineer. And I went into um, teaching a tenure track position teaching at a community college there in Washington, Pierce College, which you referred to in my bio. So um, I did that as an administrator and I've just never looked back. And I, um, I got into, a story. my husband attended a historically black college. He went to Morehouse College in Atlanta. And his experience, his undergrad experience was so much more magical than mine. So watch what you pray for, because when I would go to his homecomings and all those very handsome, black men and all these educated, confident black people, um, you know, just gathering together with such great energy inspired me. And that was something that I missed in my own undergraduate experience. I love my alma mater unconditionally, but I had a different experience. So I prayed to work in an environment like that and God gave it to me. So I went into higher education as black college in, uh, and um, uh, Wilberforce, Ohio, Central State University. And got to another glass ceiling as an administrator, vice president, and was unable to get a presidency because I did not have a doctorate because I was very corporate. So I'm, I have a non-traditional path to the presidency. So I took a leap of faith and I, at, at the age of 55, I, I Googled, um, am I too old to get a doctorate? I actually Googled those words. Half of the internet told me you're too old, forget it. The other half of the internet said, go for it. So I went with the go for it half of the internet. And I went to University of Pennsylvania and got my doctorate and um, applied for the position here. And I actually got this position uh, as I was defending my dissertation. So when I've had a very good experience here at Houston Tillerson, it's been stressful. Um, it has its, its bright spots and it also has its pain points. And I'm very proud to serve at this institution at this point of history because it has so much opportunity um, for it to give to Austin in, so, in this day and age. 
So some, some might argue that HBCUs would perpetuate a degree of segregation, a, de a degree of, uh, of separation. How do you respond to that? And what do, what do and I think you've, you've just spoken a little bit to it, what do HBCUs add? Uh, what's the value add for its students? There's a magic, uh, because, I, because I like you a lot, I'm gonna answer the question, but normally when people ask me that question, I'm like, I'm not gonna answer that question because it's, 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 it's rough with stuff. Because when I'm people sorry. question, right, no, it's, I, I get it, I get it. And it gives me an opportunity to explain why I feel that way. No one questions why we still have Catholic institutions of higher education or why we have faith-based institutions of higher education. No one questions why we have more than one Ivy League in our higher education system or why we still have privates versus publics. But people consistently question why we have a sector of higher education that is older than most of those other higher education sectors that I spoke of, some of them, um, because it's this systemic question of what is the worth. And I've gone to an Ivy League school. I went to a very large um, state institution and I went to a regional, um, small regional school for my uh, um, master's. None of those can match the magic that happens to an individual, a person of color, particularly African-American at a historically black college. For once in your life, you can be in an environment where there is no language of black. You are not told that you're less than, you're not told that you're not good in math. You are not told that you're not going to make it. You should think about going to a, a trade school. You're told that you are a genius. You are qualified to be here and you have a lot of opportunity. And this is that environment where that happens in. And um, our schools are, some of us, I'm, Houston Tillerson is in its 145th year. Some of our historically black colleges are over 150 years old. They've got the special sauce. But because of the nature of who we are as a nation, we are challenged to do a lot with a little. We're a microcosm of a larger society. Even here in Austin, we're older than the University of Texas. So we are a visual of what happens when one institution is invested in and nurtured and taken care of and another one is not. Even when you peel back the state versus private, there's still this, even when you, when you account for those, that, that difference, there's still this, um, thread in there of differences. I'm experiencing it, right, experiencing it right now in my fundraising efforts, where there are entities that lean in to give into uh, camps for children of color, or University of Texas for children of color. But then there's always a reason why they cannot give to or invest in Houston Tillerson. And ironically, I've had people tell me, you're not fiscally stable enough or you're not, we need to make sure that you, your retention rates are higher, your graduation rates are higher. So there's this thread of this hesitancy still to invest, to heal, and to invest for education for young people, because we've proven to be here for 145 years in a city like Austin. We've proven, but it's never quite enough. So to the question of the value of historically black colleges, when I see these young people come out of grossly underserved K-12 experiences and they come here and they learn about themselves as people of color, they learn about their history. We, we weave social justice into the curriculum as much as we can because we wanna build good citizens. We wanna build people who go out there and have voice people who can sit at tables to make decisions that are equitable, people that can go out there and have lived experiences so they can help um, corporations and nonprofits make more informed decisions, which is what's missing. So we fill a pipeline that uh, other institutions cannot. And we also break generational poverty. 45% of my students are from um, first generation. So we break generational poverty. We probably have about a third of our graduates that stay in Austin. Um, most of them stay in Texas, but they, a third of them stay in Austin. And that's under my tenure. And the reason being, when I first got here, we would have a, you know, a, a pep rally of all the classes, all the, stu all the students. It's called a, like a back to school kind of thing. And 
we would have, we would say, how many students are from Detroit? I mean, not Detroit, how many, that's, joke, that's my Midwesterner coming up. <laughs> how many students are from Houston? And y'all students would yell, H-Town, you know, they would all, it'd be very loud. And how many students are from Houston? And then they, I mean, D Dallas, and then the students would yell from Dallas, even from California, we have a strong, strong component of students of California because we're the most Western uh, HBCU. And then we would say, how many students are from Austin? And it would be, this is when I first got here, it would be very few students that were from Austin. So we, my staff and I made a conscious effort. We call it hyper-local. We've been doing quite a bit of hyper-local recruiting. So last year, um, at the beginning of the school year, we did the same thing. And Austin was just as loud as the students from Houston and Dallas. And that made me, it was like a personal triumph for me because I knew that that's a part of us lifting the brand in Austin. Where in Austin, everybody thinks they wanna be a Longhorn, but right. we really switched some students to say, hey, you need to be a Ram, because we're the HT Rams. So we've been hyper-local. We put um, 17 or 21 billboards up in the area um, last month to lift our brand in, in, this, in Central Texas. We went all the way out to the Killeen area. Um, so that we can, we're recruiting for our MBA program as well. And also to encourage, especially at a time like this, if you want your child to stay close to home, then they can come to Houston Tillerson University. You were talking about it, but just in case you hadn't, I want to give you an opportunity, because you were generally talking about it, to, to talk about the COVID-19 campaign, or did you do that while I was in cyberspace? No, thank you. I would love to talk about the COVID-19. Uh, that's a Please. Probably the biggest bullet on my and I think it epitomizes, it epitomizes exactly what you were talking about when I went off to cyberspace. Well, and I got worried about you. Um, well, I appreciate it. I'm back. When we, when we went online in um, March, when COVID-19 first, uh, when the pandemic first struck, I was, I'm very proud of my campus because we extended spring break. The faculty asked to extend spring break for one week. We extended spring break for a week and that gave faculty an opportunity to switch all of their curriculum to fully online. And um, their commitment to our students, that's another part of the HBCU experience, the commitment of the people who teach them and the people who nurture them, they treat them as though they're their own. We have our moles and warts, but like any institution, but at the end of the day, they care about these young people as though they were their own. That's a part of our community that we are. So we went fully online and um, we're, we're all growing. The science is evolving. So the students, when we announced that we were closing the residence halls, we lost almost 800, a little over $800,000 worth of revenue for the rest of the term because we had to refund that money back to the students because they weren't living on campus nor were they eating on campus. So that was a revenue loss for us. But the, but the learning point for me as the president was the day we were closing the halls, I had a lot of students you know, saying, Dr. Burnett, you know, I'm not gonna be able to do my homework because I don't have access to the internet. And at that time I said, you can go to McDonald's, you can go to Starbucks, there's all kinds of free Wi-Fi. it'll be okay. I was trying to you know, console them that it's gonna be okay. Little did I know in my small mind that they wouldn't be able to go to McDonald's or Starbucks because everything was going to be shut down. So that was not their, their what they, how they would normally access the internet. And then the problem exacerbated itself because the faculty came to know, not all, but a large major, majority of our students did not have the technology required. And even some of our staff and faculty, because we went to work at home orders, did not have this technology required for them to be able to have a quality experience online. So different than what we're hearing about K-12 now. It's the same thing with higher ed, but we were hit by it in a very impactful way. And then our faculty got to see into the homes of students. And I was actually on a phone call with one of my, uh, with one of my department chairs, and she was telling me that they had students that were doing their homework on their cell phones. Thank God for smartphones. So they would have to t write the assignment out and then take a picture of it and send it to the faculty member. And we have faculty members that, so we, in, in, the, in the sense of urgency, we had some um, machines that Apple had given to us in support of our African-American male teachers initiative. So we had sent some of those machines to different majors and loaned them to them. So when we decided to go online um, fully for the fall, and that was a hard decision, but it, it's the best decision for Houston Tillerson because of our size and because of the fact that 87% of my staff is of color 
Hispanic and or African American. And I have a, a, um, a lot, my staff, my average age is the, in the vulnerable population. You know. So it's not, it was, the decision was really for the, the safety of the students, the faculty, the staff, and the campus community. But that means that we now lose that revenue for a whole term for, from the residence hall and from the auxiliaries, if you will. And also the impact of that technology. So I've committed to provide every student with at that time, we were saying a laptop and or a tablet for um, them to be able to have the tool available. And then we've partnered with AT&T for um, the hotspots or the, the MIFIs, I think they're called, uh, to, to get through the, the barrier. And then some students can also use their cell phones as um, hotspots. So we, and then the faculty had asked for, for different technologies, like for example, a virtual lab. A science lab. There's technologies to be able to deliver that. We have a very robust, um, very um, gifted um, students in music. So there's software to be able to enhance the, their learning experience. So faculty made a, a list of things they needed and we codified that into our COVID-19 support fund. And we, it totals, it's between 1.3 and 1.4 million dollars um, and we've raised $300,000 to date. And I was sharing with um, you earlier, Barry, that has disappointed me because I had anticipated us to be able to be embraced in a different way. We will buy those tablets. It's going to put um, more pressure on us as a campus, but I believe that it's the best thing to do. I don't, I know it's the best thing to do because I need my students to have tools and they have to stay engaged right now. They cannot afford to take a gap year or time off. They have to stay engaged. And we're, we continue to tell my students, this is temporary. We're not going to be online. You're going to be back to your campus because they consider this their home away from home. So it's hard, but in these, in austere times such as this, it's the best decision to make and providing them with oh, services. Yeah. If uh, someone wants to contribute? You, you can go to our webpage. It's www.htu.edu. And you see it's one of the um, banners at the top. Or if you search COVID-19 support fund, COVID-19 support fund, you can find it. And there's a little video clip that plays there about the fund itself. And I think it's a concrete way for people to show their, their real commitment to affecting change. And so I because want to make sure you had need to say that. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's why I love you, Barry Silverberg. Um, it's awesome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> My wife is listening so careful. I mean, we don't want to create Okay, noise. that's okay. She, she, can, she'll, she understands what I'm saying in a moment such as this. Um, I, I appreciate it. And, you know, I saw some of the names coming on when we were coming on, when we were logging on. And I have some very deep allies and accomplices in this community. Um, uh, I won't start naming names because I'll forget someone, but they know who they are. And it's people who have really supported me and people who really get it. And there's a difference between saying you want, saying that Black Lives Matter in public, but then in private, Black university students um, matter as well. So it's, 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 it's what you do and how you operate, you know, your treasure, your time, your commitment, Ch changing the narrative, the negative narrative about the university of something that someone experienced 15 years ago, someone didn't call me back, or I sent some, I sent some money and I didn't get a thank you note, um, or, you know, something didn't happen. That's what systemic racism is, because we're a very small institution and operating with very limited resources. So when you do that, we're not as, I'm not as fully staffed as the University of Texas. So you might not get a phone call back, but if you're persistent and you really believe in something, you'll continue to lean in. And I have found that I have some allies and accomplices to the mission that have really leaned in. And I, 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 I appreciate that. Well, Kate just posted in the chat, the URL for those who do want Thank to make you. a contribution. Thank you. Thank and you. we'll have, make sure it's on the website. Thank you. So, um, unfortunately, we have limited time because I'd like to go into a lot of questions with you. As a matter of fact, if you'd be so gracious, I'd love to have you back again and, and get into some of the uh, other issues. Um, I would love that. 
particularly, I'd love to have your uh, perspective on uh, some of the issues that relate to, you know, the rising consciousness of injustice and lack of social justice and historical situations like the idea of statues and reparations and other kinds of things. Uh, but for now, this, to start down that road, we're not going to have enough time. So I'd like to reserve that. But let, let me go back to Colette uh, Vernon, uh, because you're fascinating. Uh, so I, 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 want to, I want to ask you, so if you were talking to your younger self, um, what would you tell your younger self? And I'll, you know, maybe when you were 30, three years ago. Um, but uh, you know, what, what would you tell your younger self about where you were going and what advice would you give your younger self? I would have, I would tell my younger self to embrace your history very seriously. I, the movie Hidden Figures motivated me and changed my life because I knew the history. I went to a, a big black public high school, John F. Kennedy High School. You can't get more urban than that in Cleveland. So I went to an all black, you know, I, I had one white um, girl um, in, uh, in my K-12 experience. So, um, and she played the violin and I remember that. I had all black, majority black teachers. So, but I had a phenomenal K-12 experience. And in hindsight, probably most of my teachers were black college graduates, but I didn't know that because I, my family was not a family of edu that was not fam an educated family. So they ran in different circles, if you will. So, I didn't really understand a lot of them. And then I went to Ohio State University in engineering. So I didn't get, get a liberal arts degree. So I didn't know a lot about my own history. And when I watched the movie Hidden Figures, which has been, you know, recently, it changed my perspective on my own life. Because that movie happened in 1969. And I went to Ohio State in 1975, six years later. So there were women, all HBCU graduates, I might say, which is why they had that confidence. So there were women who could not drink from the same coffee pot, could not drink from the same water fountain, could not use the same restrooms as their counterparts. And um, here I am going to Ohio State thinking that someone owes me something without really appreciating the barriers that people before me had to fight through in order for me to go to Ohio State. So it made me more of a warrior for what is right. I always had it kind of embedded in my soul. And if I think I had gotten to this, that space in my life a little earlier, I would have been able to use the gifts that God gave me to impact yet more younger people. Um, when I say that in not a regretful way, but just in a hindsight is 2020 way. And um, when I started really reading into, like even here at Houston Tillerson, the more I learn about the history of the institution and the more I learn about the history of Austin, the better leader I can become of the institution. So the more you read about history, the better person you become, um, the more informed person you become, the less cloaked in your own privilege you become. And I think your heart grows when you learn. There are two things that change people a broken heart and an open mind. And learning your history and reading is what opens your mind. And the more our minds are open, the better person we can be. So that is definitely the advice that I would give my younger self, to educate yourself as much as you possibly can on your own history, even my family history. Um, my, my children have learned more about my family history and it's helped them to become better people because they own their own family history. My daughter posted, um, that she's um, from um, picking cotton to sharecroppers to um, factory workers to a college president to her. It's quite and a leap. That's um, quite a leap in four generations. Yeah, what, one of the things I want to mention before, at least per, Wiki, per uh, Wikipedia, it said that uh, Houston Tillotson was the uh, first institution of higher learning in Austin. Mm -hmm. And I think you uh, more or less confirmed that when you talked about the different times when different institutions came together. Mm -hmm. 
So as a closing question, uh, and then we'll open it up to people. Um, and is, so who have been your, I mean, you're obviously a mentor to people and you will be, continue to be a role model, just like the women in, uh, in, in the movie we talked about. Uh, who, who have been your role models? Um, I have several. My most staunch biggest role models are my own children. My daughter is fearless. She has been caught up in the, um, she's been, she's laid off now because of the COVID-19. Her company relocated her to California to start a new um, public relations large event um, entity there. And then came COVID-19. And her courage and her tenacity make me look up to her and inspires me to continue my courage and my tenacity. My son is a, a journalist and writes about higher education and is, uh, writes about education, I'm sorry, K-12 education, he writes for Ed Week, and he's consistently schooling me on something about the education system. Um, mm -hmm. There, young people give me hope because, particularly young black people, because they are in a space where they know what their skills are and when people nurture them to that place and they take that and once they're you know confident enough to go forth then they do it i think my generation and particularly generations before had a deference to people in power and wouldn't push the envelope and wouldn't challenge these systems and what we're seeing now is young people who challenge the system um, i tell my young people be a be a protester don't be a looter be smart about your, your activism, but their lives are activists. And so they, they inspire me. Both of my children are very, um, my daughter is a, a feminist and, and almost to a fault sometimes. Um, and my son we'll is- send her um, a copy of this. <laughs> and my son is um, um, very, um, very astute when it comes to really analyzing the state of education for K-12. So both of them are definitely my, my hero, my hero, and my mentors. I learn from them some, I learn something from my children every week. It's quite a tribute. I, I, uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. So um, I, I really do hope that we will um, have a chance to continue this because I think that I'd love to, I, 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 I'd love to explore the more existential questions, if you will, uh, with you. And be we'll my pleasure. So be everybody my heard pleasure. you make that commitment, okay? You're stuck. All right. And it's recorded. And, uh, and it's recorded. If this recording ever sees the light of day. But uh, let, me, let me open it up, because uh, I'm sure there's lots of questions. And if there aren't, I've got a ton more. Uh, so let's open it up. And uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, Kate, why don't we start if there's any questions in the chat and then you can all put your screens back on um, and that way we can see you all uh, and let's move forward. So I was reading through um, a quote that you had written where it was, my advice to younger women is to listen to yourself and the quieter you become, the more you're able to hear. So learn to listen and trust your instincts and be more confident in your own thinking. And I was wondering if there was like a memorable moment that led you to have that realization, or maybe it's been over time, but um, maybe how you came to that conclusion and, and gained that confidence. Yes. As a military wife um, raising children, we, my, my children went to 13 different schools through their K-12 experience, which is a part of why they are who they are. So I was a time where I was working full time, raising two children and following my husband from place to place as a result of his career, I just had a lot swirling around me. And one of my um, mentors at the time told me, you need to be still. And I didn't really understand what she meant about being still. And then I realized that everything was just noise. I was getting stressed out about all, the, like I was trying to do everything at one time. And the quieter you become, the more you can hear, and then the more I can embrace what's really important. Because we want to win the war, 
I didn't have to win every battle, being the best mom, um, being the, you know, the superstar at work. Because when you're, when you're a, um, a woman of color in an engineering field, because I was often the only woman, I was always on spot to have to be the best. So, um, you, and your self-talk is the worst thing because you're telling yourselves all these things. If some people say to us what we say to ourselves, we would unfriend them. So you have to block out that, that noise and really focus on what's important in the moment in, in, in your life. So it's really good advice for me. And I follow that to the day because it gets, my life gets very noisy. Like a lot of stuff, a lot of naysayers, what we cannot do. And I have to learn how to really, like everybody is not my ally and accomplice. Everybody's not on, on the same mission that I'm on. So I have to find those people. And even internally, you can have sometimes people that are not leaning. That's noise. You have to like block that out and continue to focus on the good. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate the question and the reminder. <laughs> So we have a question in the chat box about, um, do you have a recommendation for resources uh, for future learning on diversity and uh, racial equity and social justice? There is a book that I read um, called White Rage. It's a very small book and I recommend it to anyone, back to history, I recommend it to anyone who really wants to understand um, the, what, what the nation was built on. And it's a very quick read. It's, um, you could read it in two days. It's the book's about this big, but this is about much documentation. The writer is a faculty uh, member, prof uh, professor at Emory. Carol Anderson is her name. The other one is um, the 1619 Project by Nicole Hannah Jones, the New York Times edition. It's very well done. And if you're not a reader, you can watch all the podcasts. So it's 1619, the 1619 Project by Nicole Hannah-Jones. We actually had her on my campus and I was just fascinated by her courage. She's a young journalist. And um, by her courage to really dig into, back to 1619, because it was, it was produced in 2019. So she did 400 years of our nation's history and um, supported by the New York Times. It was very well done. Hi there. Thank you. And Dr. Colette Pierce, thank you for, at first, I have a question, but first I'd like to thank you for sharing, sharing your, your experience and your perspective. And it's, it's uplifting during these times and it resonates a lot with what, you know, the experiences that I'm going through as, okay. as a leader of, of color. You know, I, I'm, I'm the executive director for Comi Madre, so I work with Latinas and their moms, you know, in helping them achieve that, that dream of higher education and then nice. persist in the process. So I really appreciated what you've shared, and especially about the history, the being in touch with your history. My background is as a historian of Af oh. Af African diaspora in Latin American history, so I'm always finding those commonalities. And my question for you at this very critical time is how, if you have any any ideas, any advice, any thoughts on how to form, you know, deep alliances or strengthen alliances, specifically here in, in Austin between um, the Latinx community and the African American community, which I think are necessary and, and are important. And I want to also commend you for the the march, you know, organizing that event at your university. I was part of it, and it was just beautifully organized it was just the the feeling of solidarity it was was overwhelming so i i want to say thanks and, and hear your ideas thank you um the collective there is such power in the voice of the collective my single voice can no cannot reach what four voices together can reach so the collective voice and one thing that we people of color have to be very cautious of. This back to the question Barry asked me earlier about my, my, my mentors, my heroes. My son used a term with me, talked to me about it. It was something when I was in the task force, um, the co-chair, but as I began my journey as the um, co-chair of the task force, Mayor, Mayor Adler's task force on institutional racism, and systemic inequities, I learned a lot about Austin. And one of the things that I learned about is oft times division between the black and brown communities. Mm -hmm. And um, I was sharing that with my son because coming from Ohio, we don't, that's not something that was in my everyday life. I was, had not been exposed to that. And even as we traveled internationally, that's not something I've been exposed to. 
So he said, you know, mom, there's such a term as Olympic oppre oppression Olympics. Like my oppression mm -hmm. is worse than your oppression. And that takes us nowhere because we're oppressed. Mm -hmm. So the goal is to stop oppression in all of our pillars in the community. So we have to just be conscious of that and then continue to do things together and to hear each other's voices because our experiences are different, but our journeys are similar. So, and our goal is the same. So when we compete against each other, we're not gonna win. There's an African proverb that says, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. And there's a Mexican proverb that says, they tried to bury us, but they didn't know we were seeds. So both of those proverbs are super powerful from different cultures, but we can all relate to both of them. So I think it's important for us to recognize that there is more power in our collective voices than our isolated voices and for leaders in our communities to, to, to elevate that. And I just want to spend two minutes about the, the march and the rally itself. I've had in, my, in the last six months, and I share this on, um, on with Judy on Judy's show. Judy is an ally and an accomplice. Um, in the last six months, I've had made three hard decisions, hardest decisions in my whole corporate and educational career. The first one was um, canceling or postponing commencement because commencement is a rite of passage for my campus. The second one was to have that rally on campus and the third one was to stay online in the, in, in, in the spring. Three of, three of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make in my life. The rally, the campus is open but closed because we have summer school going on. And I like to say is we have a record enrollment in summer school. We're very proud of that. So, um, um, but, so the campus is closed. So when um, Chaz Moore of the Austin Justice Coalition approached me, and Chaz was really the engine behind that rally and, and kudos to him for how well it was done, the rally in the march. When he approached me that we wanted to have a rally by Black people, for Black people on the Black college campus in the middle of a pandemic, you can imagine the thought process that I went through in my head. And as I processed it, it was my spirit told me that's something that I needed to do. And it was just a beautiful experience in so many ways. Everybody had to wear a mask coming to campus. We encouraged social distance, but the more people came. We had, I know we had about 20,000 people on campus. We know that because, um, and it was just such a moment of solid, it was very good for Austin. And so in hindsight, um, it was the right, like back to um, Brianna's question, I had to get the noise out of my head so that I could really hear what was important at that moment. And in, in that moment with the information that I, that I had and the, what I knew the purpose of the institution was. Thank you. Thank you. I believe there's another question, Kate. Yes. So um, Perry would like to know, how can the community get more involved in HG's fundraising efforts? For example, is it appropriate local media to designate a specific fundraising day or perhaps a tablet drive? What's already taken place? Is that Perry Trevelyan? Yes. I can in the Brady Bunch Square. I see you now. OK. Thank you for that question, Perry. Um, uh, you know, I have, um, let me answer the question this way. We're, we, we, our institutional advancement office in higher education, the institutional advancement office is the office that um, is, all, is over all of your fundraising efforts. And I have two people in that office. Um, my sister institutions have 200 people in their offices. So, it's hard and I'm the chief fundraiser, the chief, you know, so anytime anyone wants, wants to support our fundraising efforts, I really welcome that. So I look for the ideas and the creativity. So, if, and just contact me directly. Um, I'm very easy to, 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 to find. So if you contact me directly and there's a, something that you want to do, I can have the person who's over our fundraising um, campaigns reach out to you and we can have a, because uh, like the, the, the COVID-19 support fund, we are about to launch $1,000, $1,100, I don't know the exact number, 
buys a computer for one machine. So if an entity says, for one student, if an entity says, okay, so we're going to support the athletes and I'm going to make up something, uh, there are 85 athletes, we have more than that, there are 85 athletes, then I'm going to launch a campaign to raise $85,000 at my church. So little pockets like that. And the money's, we've only, we've, I shouldn't say only, we've raised $300,000 so far, and I'm very super grateful for that. That money has come mostly from individuals. Uh, in my office, you can't see it, but I have a picture of Friedman's um, envelopes because in the 1800s, um, people would give like $2, which was their whole life savings to the Freedmen's Bureau to be able to support historically black colleges. And that's how they sustain themselves. So that encourages me that there are people still believing in me. And we've had some, you know, people, some entities step up to the plate, University of Federal Credit Union. I really want to give them a shout out because they've really leaned in. So if you're a University of Federal Credit Union customer, they are about the business. Austin Stone Community Church has been very generous to us. So there are some entities that have been very generous to us. Um, and it's getting the word out through individuals. So to, to respond to Perry's question, if you have an idea, a concept, or push people to the website to give, I would greatly appreciate that. Um, we, we are, I would welcome that opportunity. And I would just Because add. the more we can tear, tell our story, the better it is. And we have really good, we have a really powerful story. And it's just really hard when you're small to get that story out. When I first got here, people really didn't know or respect the university for the gift that it is for our community. Yeah, and I think that it's also a very, very important manifestation of all of the words we say about Black Lives Matter and about racial equity and social justice. And I think that supporting institutions, be it Houston Tillotson or others, that carry out the work on a day-to-day -day basis is absolutely essential. And so um, uh, I, I think it's an important thing we all do. Do we have any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Angela. Yeah, hi, good morning. Can you all hear me? Yes, good morning. I'm off, off mute. Um, thank you for your presentation and conversation. Uh, um, I have a question about um, students on campus who are biracial. So I, you know, am biracial and my kids are now also biracial um, and uh, just wondering what sort of support and conversations are had on campus with a historically, you know, black college. Um, just wondering if it's like the opposite for students who are not um, who are trying to identify as one or both races. And um, it's, it's just definitely conversations that we're having in our house. Um, and, you know, the last month, two months have, you know, definitely been um, just, yeah, uh, enlightened. And I did listen to that 1619 podcast. I was uh, traveling to Chicago a couple of weeks ago and it was great. It was really, really good, and um, I learned some things that <laughs> I was just like, wow, that runs deep. A lot of uh, the institutional racism runs deep. So I, I'm biased because I'm a staunch supporter of historically black colleges, and I own that. So take that in, you know, into um, your spirit as I say what I say. Um, you're not a color on my campus, but you are a color on my campus, if that makes sense. This is a color brave, not a color blind campus. So a student that's biracial, the other students are gonna see them just as one of us. It's a very nurturing place. Mm -hmm. um, we do have polarization among my athletes sometimes. I see the Hispanic um, <clears throat> sitting in one section and the black students will sit in another section the Asian students will sit in the section. But when it comes down to like a thing, they're all Houston Tillotson University students. You know, it's the, there's a book, Why Do All the Black Kids Sit Together in the Cafeteria? Um, and it's very eye-opening that student might, people migrate to them with their own selves. But, but in, the, in their day-to-day -day lives, um, historically black colleges have never segregated, never. 
they've always been open to all races. And that's still the case today. So in fact, that's why my campus is 69%, give or take, 70%, give or take, depending on the term, African and Black, and then 23, 24% um, Hispanic, Latinx community. Uh, so it's, a, it's an open environment. It's a very nurturing environment. And it's a historically black college and by nature of the definition of what a historically black college is, but it's a very nurturing environment where once in your lifetime, you don't have to be the mixed kid. You don't have to be the kid that has to, you know, identify with being white or identify with being black. You can just be a kid and you can come to grips with, you know, your culture and who you are as a person and that the color of your skin does not define who you are. The color of your skin is a part of who you are. And then your blackness is always going to be with you because of the color of your skin. So, um, and all black colleges are not monolithic. We're not all the same. My son went to a black college and my daughter did not. So um, she started one when it wasn't for her, when her experience. So you have to find the right fit for your student. But if you're looking right. for a place where you want your child to be nurtured, you want your child to be taken care of and someone sees them as them, and not the mixed kid, not the black kid, not the white kid. This is that kind of place. So unfortunately, we're, uh, I'm sorry, Angela, did you want to follow up on that? Oh, no, no, that was great. Thank you. Okay. So unfortunately, we're out of time. So I want to give uh, Colette a chance to say anything that you want to say that we may not have asked you uh, or anything along those lines. And then we, then I'll do some concluding remarks and I just want to say that I'm grateful for the, the, the opportunity to share the story of the university. If you have not been on the campus when things, when we are back to some, our new normal, um, I encourage you to come to campus and um, to spend time on the campus to get to know us. We are a jewel in the, um, the crown of Austin. We are, and we're only going to continue to get better. We will be a stronger university on the other side of this. And I would like to say this is not related to the university. Well, it is related to the university. One of the things besides the technology gaps, what we also found is that our young people are under a lot of stress in times like this um, because they don't know what, what the future holds for them. And adults process that very different than young adults do, than children do. So if you have any young adults in your life or any children in your life, don't take for granted that they're being strong. You know, we always say check on your strong friend but check on your strong young people too, um, if you have those in your life, because they, they need, even if it's a virtual hug right now, that someone's thinking about them. Wise words, thank you. So I wanna thank you all for joining us today. As I said, this is part of a series. Um, it's our small effort on the part of our Center for Nonprofit Studies to, as I said before, heighten people's consciousness and give people an opportunity to really think about these critical issues and so that we can better understand each other and have a better society. So you can read more about uh, Dr. Colette Pierce Burnett uh, at our website and about Houston uh, Tillotson University, uh, as well as uh, connections to the various topics we just talked about at nonprofitaustin.org slash civil society. And I, uh, we would be honored if you would join us in our future programs as well. And a hearty, hearty thank you to uh, Colette. Um, it's a pleasure knowing you and uh, you remain an extremely fascinating person. Um, and uh, there, I'm sure that there are many on this call who share with me that you are a role model for many of us. And we all heard you make the commitment. We will have another show with uh, Colette uh, sometime. She doesn't know it yet, but it'll be in August or September. So, Very good. And she can manage her time better than the rest of us. We'll let her set the date. He will uh, help me manage my time. See, there you go. <laughs> well, I thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, have a great day and stay safe.